All right, Alexander, let's do an update on Ukraine. Um, start from the situation on the ground. It seems like we, no, it doesn't seem, we definitely have two fronts now. We have uh, Bakhmut and then we have Zaporozhye. Uh, there's a lot of uh, panic from uh, the uh, Elensky regime with regards to Belarus as well, that there might be a third front. No one knows, but they're definitely concerned about that. I've seen reports that Ukraine has something like 17 or 18,000 uh, troops close to the, to the Belarus border. We have Lavrov in South Africa. He is saying some very interesting things with regards to the conflict in Ukraine. Basically, that this is this may be considered a hybrid war, but it's moving away from a hybrid war if it hasn't already moved away from a hybrid war. And we have uh, the tank saga, <laughs> the tank saga, which you know is is just getting more ridiculous in my opinion with each passing uh, day. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, where, where where do you well, want to begin? Let, we well, start let, with let, the ground situation. Yeah, I mean that, that's doing? that that's our traditional thing, and let's do it. And I think that's always the best way because, as you correctly said, we have a two front war. We got the battles in and around Bakhmut and Solidar, and all the indications are here that, firstly, the Ukrainians are not pulling back. They've been advised to do it by the U.S. There was an article in Reuters, very interesting article, by the way. I discussed it extensively in a video that I did for my own channel, but very interesting article. It's now known that the US is advising Ukraine to pull back from Bakhmut. They're not doing it. They're holding firm. They're trying to defend Bakhmut. They're trying to defend other places around Bakhmut. They still haven't admitted officially that they've lost Solidar, but it's now clear that the fighting has moved west of Bakhmut. So if you think about it, the Russians are to the north, the east, the south. They're now sending their forces west of Bakhmut. Fighting is now going on in all sorts of villages and settlements well to the west of Bakhmut. We are very close to a tight ring around the Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut. Uh, uh, um, a, an actual cauldron being created there. And Zaluzhny is supposed to have told uh, Zelensky that the same is happening further north around a town called Sevesk. And he's apparently begged Z Zelensky to pull Ukrainian troops out of uh, Sevesk, but he's not doing that. So we see a big operational crisis for Ukraine in Bakhmut, in Donbass. But now they have this other problem because two days ago, three days ago, the Russians started an offensive in Zaporozhye region. And I wasn't sure what to make of it. I, is this a reconnaissance in force? Are the Russians probing and testing Ukrainian defences? Or is this a serious offensive? Now, I've come round to the view that it probably is a very serious offensive. Now, they're advancing, the Russians are advancing on basically two fronts. One is towards a town called Orekhov, which they seem to be preparing to take into a pincer movement. And the point about Orekhov is that if you take Orekhov, you can then advance beyond that north towards another town called Pavlograd. If they take Pavlograd, which is about 60 kilometers further away, then they're able to cut off any supplies to the Ukrainian troops in Donbass from Zaporozhye. And that's a critical lifeline. That would be an absolute huge crisis for Ukraine. You could start to talk about even a cauldron for the entire Ukrainian force in uh, Donbass if that happens. But there's now another advance along the east bank of the Dnieper River. And that seems to be heading in the direction of Zaporozhye city. Zaporozhye city is one of the big industrial cities of Ukraine. Before the war, it had a population of about 750,000. Lots of big industrial factories and plants there, including the giant Motosic factory, which made engines for Soviet aircraft and helicopters. It's a major industrial center. And all the indications are that Ukraine is in a panic, that they're worried that the Russians are moving to take Zaporozhye. 
and if they do that will be a crisis for ukraine as well and they're now rushing troops to try to defend Zaporozhye and building fortifications there now the key point is that the russians are able to make these advances because the ukrainians have stripped their forces in Zaporozhye they've concentrated the greater the better part of their army to try to control Bakhmut, defend Bakhmut. They're not prepared to defend, to withdraw from Bakhmut. And the result is that they're weak in Zaporozhye region, which has allowed the Russians to advance. And reports now are coming that they're having to send um, reinforcements to Zaporozhye. They can't really send them from the Donbass. So they're having to transfer reserves people that they've been holding back people who are still going through their training they're being sent hurriedly to the battle lines to try to plug the gaps the gap in Zaporozhye so it's an operational crisis for Ukraine there and you talked about the 18,000 troops that they've deployed along the Belarus border well that sounds impressive but then Douglas McGregor says that the Russian force in Belarus numbers 100,000 men. So if that's activated. Well, if it's, you know, strike south, well, 18,000 men are an obstacle, obviously, and the trip wire, and no doubt the fortifications and barriers and all that kind of thing. But they would be very heavily outnumbered. And there's also reports that the Ukrainians are now worried about Kiev itself. And they're building fortifications there too. And in the meantime, Russian reconnaissance groups have been operating around a northern Ukrainian town called Sumy, briefly occupied by the Russians at the start of the war. Quite a big place. Again, there's a big Russian advance in that area. There's not enough Ukrainian troops or there's a lack of Ukrainian troops on the ground, perhaps to stop them. I don't want to get ahead of things, but everything that you're describing to me, if this was chess, I would say that it, it's getting very close to, to the queen, to, to the king being in a, in a checkmate scenario. Absolutely. Absolutely. You'd say check and you, you know, the six different moves. pieces are, <laughs> exactly. are maneuvered. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, no. but we could no, be no, far no, off. We from could this. be far off. I'm exactly. just saying everything. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, I, but, exactly. but, you know, listening to you I'm, and from the information that I'm getting, they're bogged down in Bakhmut. They're, they're uh, unprepared to, to defend Zaporozhye and they have to keep an eye out in, uh, in Belarus. And so they, they just don't, you know, they don't know what to do. And, and any move that you make, it, it, it's, it, it seems like there's, Whichever way you move your king, you know, he's in danger of of getting taken out, it seems. But anyway, that's, that's exactly um, right. so, yeah. so that's the situation. Yeah. So that's the situation on the ground. What about this this tank thing that is going on? Uh, Germany is just being threatened on all sides. Uh, you know, this is this has reached panic levels. It has it in has. the European Union and the United States. This leopard two thing has reached absolute panic levels, and and with the leopard twos, they always put a little bit of a sprinkle of of long range missiles to Crimea. I mean that's that's the narrative. Leopard leopard twos have to go to Ukraine to break through the Russian defenses, and then the long range missiles to Crimea. Game over. Ukraine wins. I mean this is in summary paraphrasing. This is the narrative, and they been completely overtaken with this uh, this idea of of the Leopard 2s coupled with long range attacks in Crimea is is the silver bullet to, de to defeating Russia. Yes, it, it, it's, be take? it's right. becoming hysterical and, uh, and showing clear signs of desperation. I mean, Charles Michel, who is the president of the European Council, the European Union's 
president. Ursula von der Leyen is his prime minister and Charles Michel is his president. Anyway, he's come out and said that the next two or three weeks will be decisive in the war. <laughs> now, what does he mean by that? Presumably what he means is that, you know, if Germany, you know, agrees to supply these 20 Leopard 2 tanks and, you know, the poles cut in and provide another 15 or whatever it is. Well, all that's somehow going to um, save this deteriorating situation. You know, the person who actually undercut that entire narrative is none other than Zelensky himself. He's just given an interview for German television in which he said, well, you know, by all means, please give us some tanks. We need them. But, you know, don't think that if you give us a couple of, you know, about a couple of dozen tanks, that's going to make any difference against an adversary who has thousands of tanks. So that begs the question of why in that case even do it. But one feels that overall there is now a sense of panic. People, when they're in a panic, start doing stupid things. And because the Germans have been trying to resist and say no to these Leopard 2 sales, all these panicky leaders in London, Brussels, Paris, Washington and elsewhere and Warsaw are doubling down and are beating up on the Germans and bullying them. And in a way, you can understand why, because if there aren't Leopard 2 supplied to Ukraine or if not enough Leopard 2 to supply to Ukraine to make a difference, as Zelensky says. Well, you've now got the perfect excuse. Blame the Germans. It was they who caused Ukraine to lose. They didn't supply Ukraine with enough or with any Leopard 2s. And that's, that's the narrative that's been spun. There's been some extraordinary articles bashing the Germans in the, in the British media over the last two days. A uh, few days, uh, comparisons with Neville Chamberlain and appe you know, talking about appeasement and all those awful things. And as I said, in reality, anybody who looks at the gathering picture can see it isn't going to make any difference. So Macron is meeting with Schultz, I think today, and they were talking about gas deals and hydrogen energy deals. And Macron talked about tanks and France is considering to send those uh, those Leclerc tanks, but maybe, maybe not. He's he's discussing things. You know, Macron is really deep in in military strategic thought, yes. being the great military strategist that Macron yeah, he's, is. He's Napoleon. The heir he's, to he's, Napoleon. He, yeah, exactly. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but but my question to you is, what? Okay, I understand the 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 the, the mantra of you know keep Russia out you know, keep the U.S. in and keep Germany down. I understand that that's being fulfilled, if, if it hasn't already been fulfilled. But what more do they have to gain by beating up on Germany? You've destroyed the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. You're deindustrializing Germany. Um, and, and now you're going to, to blame them for anything that goes wrong in the conflict with Ukraine. I mean, I, I can see, okay, so for example, I can see why this benefits France, because Macron is always seeing Germany as maybe an obstacle to his accession as the top leader in the European Union. He's always had kind of that second fiddle to Angela Merkel or to Germany. He's had that complex. So I can see why Macron, in his own way, wants to beat up on Germany. I, I, I can see Poland, why they may want to beat up on Germany, because maybe Poland feels that with the backing of the United States, we can then be the big, you know, industrial powerhouse you know, countries say in, in, in Europe, I don't know, but I, I'm still trying to figure out why, what, and, and I can see the United States, why, why the United States wants to deindustrialize uh, Germany and keep Germany down. But I'm still, all, all of this, it doesn't really feel like it's no. concrete. It feels like it's a little, uh, you know, but what is there really to gain by destroying Germany in this way on all levels? Yes. Uh, economic, uh, social, uh, confidence-wise. I mean, this is like an yeah. all-out attack on Germany it is, that it we're is, seeing taking place right now. It, it, it is becoming increasingly obsessive and increasingly hysterical. The fundamental reason is that they don't trust the Germans. I mean, that's what it all comes down to. And the reason they don't trust the Germans is because every European government, deep down, knows the truth. If the Germans and the Russians 
get together, I mean, seriously, properly, really get together, in Europe, they're irresistible. That <laughs> They would form a power block that nobody could stand up to. I mean, that's been repeatedly proved in the past, and it's the nightmare that exists in every European capital. So when the Germans try to exercise restraint in relation to their relations with Russia, they don't want to burn all the bridges. They don't want to, I mean, there's even some, about Germans now talking about reviving the Nord Stream pipelines, for example. When that happens, that creates this, you know, absolute hysterical reaction. The Germans can't really be trusted. They're thinking of trying to do some kind of deal with the uh, uh, Russians. The Molotov Ribbentrop Pact is, you know, once more on the horizon. You know, there's going to be another version of it. And that's that's why. And um, the Germans are constantly put to the challenge of proving their loyalty to the rest of the West by taking even more extreme positions, always contrary to their own interests. Now, of course, the point is that because the current German government is weak, because the current German Chancellor is weak and indecisive and inexperienced, because within the current German government there is a Green Party which is absolutely, tar you know, fervidly Atlanticist in its thinking. They've been able this time over the last year to get the Germans to go along with an awful lot of what they wanted. But I think the other thing that's now starting to cause panic and anger is that there's the first signs of a backlash emerging. I mean, apparently Baerbock's foreign ministry uh, has produced a policy paper, a strategy paper, which basically says that Germany should take a strong line against China and, you know, seek to decouple from China. The, the German business community, which has been accepting these anti-Russian policies through gritted teeth, but they've gone along with them. Apparently they said, enough's enough. We're not prepared to agree to that. They've been furiously lobbying in Berlin against this strategy paper from Baerbock. Um, so there's, all, there's that worry. They're also saying, the German business people are apparently also saying, look, we've just managed to get through this year with gas. There's going to be major problems next year. The Dutch are having to close the Göttingen uh, uh, natural gas field, which is EU's biggest. Uh, we don't have the real alternatives to Russian gas. US LNG is now going to Asia. It's not going to come to us. So, you know, some of them are even talking about reviving Nord Stream. So there's that issue. The German army, and now, you know, I've, I've done programs about this, whole succession of generals, three now, have come out and said this Leopard 2 uh, delivery to Russia makes absolutely no sense. Ukraine is losing the war. Sending a few Leopard 2s isn't going to make a difference. The way people are talking is going to, it's going to lead us into World War Three. So there's that happening. And, of course... There's German public opinion is now swinging. So opinion polls now coming out of Germany make it absolutely clear that most Germans oppose bigger arms transfers to Ukraine. So all of these European leaders are seeing all of this and they're getting worried that Germany is wobbling and that makes them determined to beat up on Germany even more. And of course, the, the, the risk they run is by doing that they will feed the they they will feed the backlash. I mean, the military in Germany, in particular, is now becoming increasingly outspoken in a way that no other military in NATO has been up to this point. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Lavrov, his statements. Yeah, as absolutely. He was in well, South Africa. Well, indeed. I mean, any, you know, any comments well, absolutely. I mean, like, first of all, it's Im important that Lavrov is in South Africa. I mean, you know, Russia is not isolated, and the reason he's in South Africa is because obviously uh, South Africa is a fellow BRICS member state. South Africa is one of the key powers in Africa. You know, Nigeria and South Africa are the two biggest 
powers in Africa, both of them, by the way, friendly to Russia, but South Africa especially so. And the South Africans, um, you know, they haven't exactly sided with Russia in this conflict, but they've shown sympathy and understanding for the Russian position. And so Lavrov goes to a friendly country, a BRICS country, and he's making all sorts of very strong statements. And he says, we're not in a hybrid war really anymore. This is becoming very, coming very close now to becoming a direct Russia-NATO war. It's very dangerous, but that's where it's heading. If the West continues along this track, that's where it will fully go. We'll get, you know, we're in danger of a direct clash. And on top of that, he's also said, which all of which is true, by the way. I mean, he's not scaremongering. He's saying it as it is. I mean, you know, the, the rhetoric coming out of the West now is becoming, as I said, increasingly hysterical. But he's also saying other things. He says, look, hopeless to talk about negotiations with Ukraine. They're not capable of negotiating. We've always been ready to negotiate. And of course, the head of the Ukrainian intelligence service, uh, military intelligence, Kirill Budanov, has now played straight into Lavrov's hands. He said all those negotiations that happened in March like last year were simply a ruse to string the Russians along. So, of course, Lavrov is going around telling everybody. You see, even Ukraine's intelligence chief is admitting this. We've always been serious about negotiations. The Ukrainians are not. And Budanov said that one of Ukraine's key negotiators was one of his own agents and was then murdered by a rival Ukrainian intelligence agency. It's, it's an extraordinary story, by the way. Uh, and, you know, Lavrov is, is going around saying, how, how am I supposed to negotiate with these people? <laughs> you know, we are, we are a serious country. We're a serious government. We've been open to negotiation all along. But, you know, this isn't a real government that we're up against. It's a gangster outfit. <laughs> it, you know, they, they, they murder each other. They're not serious about talks. And, of course, behind them in, is the West, which is clearly now in a state of undeclared war with us. So, you know, you, it's Lavrov's position. It's the one he's explaining to the South Africans. He's going to be very convincing because what he says is essentially true. And Ukraine's own top intelligence chief, has now made all kinds of statements that will strengthen what Lavrov is saying. And you can be absolutely sh sure that, you know, the Russian foreign minister is translating all of Budanov's interviews into English and that it's been passed on to the South Africans and into Portuguese and passed to the Brazilians and into Spanish, and circulated across Latin America and into French and it's been circulated in West Africa. And, you know, so that's what Lavrov is doing. And he always does it well. Yeah, I remember those negotiations just to finish it up. Uh, I remember the optics of it was was pretty much the Russians coming in serious, you know, wearing their their suits and you know coming in with, with like a real negotiation team. And they're sitting down and across the table from them were a bunch of guys dressed like they, they, they just they, they finished a workout at the local gym or something like that. Not that there, there, there's anything wrong with, you know, dressing like you're you're at the gym. But if you're negotiating for peace during a, a war, I would yeah. imagine that you would present yourself in a much more serious manner. Yes. And yes. when I saw those those optics, I was just like, I don't know. The, these guys look serious. These guys look like they're they don't really care. And exactly. I guess Budanov has kind of admitted yeah, to that. Absolutely. But I mean, as I said, the, the revelation that one of these people, one of these negotiators was one of his own agents and he was bumped off <laughs> by another Ukrainian intelligence. The... <laughs> I mean, that, that, I mean, I have to say, I mean, I, I just couldn't believe that. I mean, I, yeah, that that was even a, that is so casually admitted. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is no big deal. You know, we 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 kill each other's agents. I mean, within our within the Ukrainian intelligence world, this is apparently something that regularly happens. I mean, 
it, 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 it just it just stunned me. And of course, you know, these people, as you correctly said, they didn't look serious. They didn't they were, didn't just look like they'd come back from the gym in workouts. They'd look like, well, they were unshaven. They looked they looked. Anyway, they didn't look like real serious negotiators. And, I mean, it does put what Budanov says. I don't know how true it is, by the way, but what Budanov says does put the whole negotiating process back in March, which seemed at one point to be leading to some kind of a resolution. It does put it in a particular light. And one person, by the way, who's going to be absolutely furious about this is going to be Erdogan. Because the Russians are going to come along, yeah. and because he, he he was the mediator, he broke at this. The Russians are going to say, "Well, you're asking me to negotiate. You're asking us to negotiate with these people. Look at what Budanov has just said. Yeah. They wasted they wasted your time. They, they wasted, wasted everybody's time. Every time, exactly. And not only that, these are the the this is this is the uh, the government that the EU and the United States holds in such high regard as, as a government of human rights and democracy. They 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 uh, they, they take out a negotiator because there's some sort of spat between the GUR and the SBU. So. So they knock off uh, one of the negotiators. This this is the EU values human rights government. And this is the government that every single country in the collective West is destroying their economies, emptying out their weapon stockpiles for. Yes. This is the government. These yes. are the guys. Yes. Bravo. Well, absolutely. Job well done. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, you know, it, 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 it's, it was a, it's a bizarre <laughs> interview. And the very fact that Budanov talks in this fashion, by the way, shows what it also tells you a lot about these people. I mean, it shows you the kind of people they are. I mean, they, they clearly feel they can talk in this way openly about, you know, the fact that they were stringing everybody along in these negotiations and murdering each other. <laughs> and that, you know, well, won't have any international or global impact at all. And you're absolutely right. I mean, Erdogan will be furious. But of course, in Brussels, they're now so obsessed with this thing and so committed now that they don't want to see it, even though, as you rightly said, it tells us all we need to know about the kind of government we're talking about. On another front, by the way, and coming back to a discussion we had before, Budanov is again bringing himself to prominence in a way that suggests to me that he's maneuvering for power in some fashion. Yeah. Yeah. Look, the the you had the helicopter crash, which we don't know no. what it was, but that that did some damage to to people in government in yeah. Ukraine. You have Aristovich, who's doing all kinds of weird things. Okay, he's talking a lot and he's saying a lot of truth, and uh, you know we, we have our suspicions why he's he's doing that, but he's doing it. Nonetheless, and this guy was Olensky's best buddy. That was his theater. That was his theater buddy. I mean, you know, the, those Absolutely. two guys were were making television shows together. And now you have Budanov, who's all of a sudden this guy's coming out of uh, the shadows and he's he's saying all kinds of things and admitting all kinds of things. Be between these admissions from Budanov, uh, that that they have no problem um, assassinating a negotiator. No problem. The admission of Merkel and Hollande and Boroshenko that they have no problem admitting that, you know, they were faking the whole Minsk Accords between the seizing of assets that is now taking place openly. What kind of they are doing so much damage to the collective West. Uh, is this deliberate? Because every other country in the world is probably looking at this and they're saying, these these people are just out of their freaking minds, but I'm not going to deal with anybody from from the collective West anymore because these guys are, are just out of control. Well, that's exactly what people are saying. And you can see it all over the place. You see the Saudis patching things up with the Chinese <laughs> moving towards the other side. You see India becoming increasingly disillusioned. You see Brazil, uh, uh, um, you know, Lula is now actively apparently re-engaging with the BRICS. You see more and more countries doing that. Mexico is talking about Argentina visa, and Brazil. Uh, Brazil, Argentina and Brazil forming, you know, the currency union. Mexico talking about visa free 
uh, access for Russians. <laughs> you can see that everybody is now saying to themselves, these people in the West have gone crazy and they're bank backing a government that's led by a bunch of gangsters. <laughs> and I mean, you know, they're not wrong. Oh boy, all right. Uh, any other final thoughts before we wrap it up? Well, well, we'll see what happens over the next few weeks. I mean, I think Jean-Michel is right. We probably are in the next two, three weeks in a t at a tipping point. I mean, it's what Lloyd Austin was saying the other day. But, you know, I, I, I think that it's a tipping point which everybody can see is heading in one direction rather than another. Let, let me ask you a quick question. Do you think that the collective West, given the fact that they like to practice this deceit and this, you know, we're, we're trying to buy time here and we're deceiving you with enforcing this contract there. Do you think that perhaps everything that they're that they're doing, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely giving them a lot of credit here. So just keep that in mind. I'm giving them a lot of credit. But do you think they're doing all of this stuff because maybe they have something up their sleeves? Well, I one would Austin and Michelle, yeah, maybe I mean, they, they have they, some they... sort of secret secret plan that they're ready to launch and they're doing all of these things to, to buy yes. time and to distract and to... Well, I think, I think they might do. That's the trouble. But you see, the trouble is it's probably a crazy plan. <laughs> it's probably a plan that uh, any rational person, if they looked at it, would, you know, clutch their head and say, what earth is this? This is lunacy. Because every single plan that they've come up with up to now has been a disaster. And I, I would not be surprised if they come up with something, you know, you know, something big over the next few weeks, Polish intervention, something like that. Who knows? I don't know what, but whatever it is, no good will come of it. No good thing will come of it. It might make things more dangerous, but it won't make things better. All right, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rockfin as well. And go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code GOODDAY. Take care.